Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. It's a pleasure and an honor for me to be here today and speak to you on behalf of the 100th anniversary of your academy. And thank you very much also, Basson, for this fantastic invitation. What I want to talk about here now is a piece that maybe some of you see as blue sky research, some of them might see as incremental. So I just had a fantastic introduction into this area in terms of generic, how research is done, as well as maybe this topic in, in particular. So if we look at uh, wireless communication, I'm coming to this area as a wireless communication person, we see that um, now this obviously has nothing to do with wireless communication, right? This is the election of my previous boss. Um, this was Pope Benedict, Via della Conciliazione, everybody waiting for the big announcement. And then obviously a couple of years later, when Pope Franciscus was being elected, it looked a little different. So if we look on the left side, we do see actually on the bottom left and bottom right, two people using a cell phone to text, to interact. On the right side, we see most of the people use it as a camera. If we start putting in all this data into the network, we have the need for a huge amount, a humongous amount of data rates. So if you think of like uh, the data rates that we see growing over the years, like when I first came up with this chart, at that time I also was chief scientist, I'm not chief scientist now, of Philip Semiconductor at that time. And the whole idea was in 2003, will wireless continue to progress in terms of innovation? And I said, look here, this is my uh, provocative statement that yes, the data rate will increase 10x every five years, double a every 18 months, Moore's law will happen. And when I at that time said, we will have cellular phones that work with 100 megabit per second data rate, people thought, this is ridiculous. Why do we need 100 megabit? And today we have 4G with 100 megabit and it's still too slow. So the question, if we look at those pictures that I just showed from Villa de la Conciliazione, you see that it is not a question, do we need this data rate, but how do we address the research challenges to get these enormous data rates into the air? And um, so in 2025, if you look at the graph, we will have one terabit per second on Wi-Fi, and we will have a 10 gigabits per second in cellular technology. And how to do this with limited capacity, limited energy, this is a big research challenge that we as a wireless community have been working on for many years. But the question is, is that it? Or have we forgotten something? And uh, so eight or seven years ago, I sat down and looked at, this was not my phone at the time, but looked at the phone and said, what is it that we might have forgotten when we look at these phones and talk about our level of interactivity? And obviously, one of them would be speech recognition and things like that. But the other is actually something else. Because if we take an object and we touch and feel an object, yes, we have a tactile interaction with the object. The question is, what is the latency that our eyes expect this object to be moving? As we just saw very nicely on the previous talk in the demos with the hand, we saw that person moving the hand and the virtual part of it moving the hand in almost zero latency. What does almost zero latency mean for us humans? So if you talk to physiologists and psychologists, they tell you that zero latency for a tactile visual interaction means we want to see the object move within a millisecond. Is that a challenge? Yes, because in voice communication, we want to have a latency of not more than 100 milliseconds. So 100 milliseconds is a tenth of a second. One millisecond, one thousandth of a second. So if we look at today's networks, they're all optimized for voice. And in a 4G system, even we are talking about 70 or 50 milliseconds latency today. And if we want to use this to actually move objects, real and virtual objects, we have to get this down to one single millisecond. What is the challenge by going that route, taking that route? Obviously, we can look around and look at gaming parties. So we see gamers on the planet know 
that latency counts. If I click on an object and I want to see the reaction on the other side, I have to have this in this kind of a situation because I'm looking at a screen, not in a millisecond, but in around 10 milliseconds. And what is the challenge? The challenge is that speed of light is so slow. Yes, speed of light is only 300 kilometers per millisecond, which means that if I was to do online gaming between Rio and let's say uh, Lisboa or New York or other places, then obviously it's more than 3,000 kilometers away. So just the speed of light is more than 10 milliseconds. And then getting a round trip latency response gives you no chance to do interactive gaming. That means <clears throat> we really have a challenge here to build systems that have this low latency. The speed of light alone is a challenge. The next thing is obviously if we look at this and say, now, if physiologists tell us this and psychologists, is this true? So here a friend of mine, Frank Fitzig, is wearing our Google, uh, our Oculus with two mounted, head mounted cameras. And with this, we now can set the latency between what you see and what you get to different speeds to just experiment and see, is this really true? Do we really need this millisecond? Or are we over-exaggerating? And what you see here is an experiment where the person is trying to catch the ball and it's catching the ball with the whole uh, body. If we then crank the latency up to above 150 milliseconds, then what we see is not so happy. <laughs> and if we then turn it down to the minimum latency, which in this setup is around five to 10 milliseconds, we see the person catches the ball, the student, but with a displacement. What is the displacement? Well, if I throw an object to you, it travels at about 10 meters per second, which is a centimeter per millisecond. So if you're 10 milliseconds late, you catch it with 10 centimeter displacement, you have no chance catching any ball. So this again shows that physics, when we just throw a ball and things like that, physics is giving us in our perceptive interaction with real life this limit that we need to get the real world and what we see, the virtual world, down to one millisecond, otherwise it doesn't function. The next question, obviously, is then, what are there besides catching balls? Are there other applications? And uh, if we look at this, this is a picture which is also being shown many times from like Sony talking about next generation wireless, what do we need? And then they talk about big, strong cameras, quad. Uh, high definition resolution, whatever all. But what can we do? We can only zoom. And that's not interesting. If we look at this, we see a second person also holding up a camera. If we were co connecting these two cameras, we could actually pan between these two points of view. We could digitally render any point of view between these two. Or if we go to a stadium and have 80,000 cameras, 80,000 people, sitting in a, in a stadium, then we have 80,000 sources that we can use to, a, to generate a rendering machine. Then we can calculate the point of view out of any point of view. So if our favorite player is down there, it does not have, he or she does not have to wear a GoPro camera, but we can digitally render this image into us. We see the red guy with the ball, or we can be actually the ball and be whacked over the field at 200 kilometers per hour. This is a complete new level of interaction. If you see Formula One car racing 20 years ago, compared to now with the head-mounted cameras or downhill mountain biking today, you get, that's when you get excitement, this level of interactivity. In this kind of setup, we do not need one millisecond. We're far away from the field. We're not catching the object ourselves. So we need about 10 millisecond latency. So you see, it very much depends upon what kind of situation I am in. If I need exactly one millisecond or 10 milliseconds are good enough, it's somewhat in that range. However, if we then get into some kind of, let's say, um, more haptic interaction with real life, today, if we want to clean up a hazardous environment to a problem, we move in with these kind of robots. If you start learning to operate one of these robots, it's a hassle. So what do we really want to do? We want to move into that, have ourselves been extended by a humanoid robot. We see what the robot sees. We can catch an object as it falls 
on time, in time, and do all kinds of things. Remote surgery, we can clean up hazardous systems, we can play games, we can do whatever all with this kind of scenarios. Obviously, for this, we need to have a massive improvement. Germans love cars. And not only Germans love cars, many others love cars, so let's have a look at some automotive requirements. If you are on a country road, let's say I'm on a country road uh, in Brazil, um, going up to Vitoria from uh, Rio, then obviously if I look at the road, it's windy and I have plenty of slow objects in front of me that I would like to pass. So if you're sitting in the green car, you would like to know, is that orange car there or not? How do I do that? I really would have to connect all the cameras of the cars into one kind of a system and then build a virtual view, a bird's eye virtual view of the scenario so that I can see the scenario from above. It's not a big problem, it's just a big rendering engine problem. And then project that view into my own heads up display. And with this, I can actually see what's happening. Now, this has to be happening in real time. So that if I turn the wheel and I see the reaction, it's not like driving a Buick. When I turn the wheel, two seconds later something happens, but I want to have more of BMW or Porsche kind of interaction. And if we then look at cars, today already we have the problem of this one millisecond latency. Why? Because the wheels of the car are about three meters apart, which means you get a resonance frequency buildup between uh, the axles and the range of 50 hertz. If we look at control engineers, what do they tell us? Control engineers tell us, well, we need to, in this kind of a situation, be able to control a resonance buildup and attenuate this, yes, cancel this out. For that, we have to sample 10 times per resonance frequency, and then we can cancel any resonance buildup. If it is a nonlinear input that is creating this resonance, if it's a very nice swing and everything is ideal, then obviously uh, we need a, not, not this high sampling rate. And that's why electronic stability control in cars is all about two milliseconds uh, latency control. If we then build the next kind of system in, in cities, want to deal with traffic, we have to want to have platoons. Um, or convoys, and with that we need to be able to couple the electronic stability control of cars with each other. It's an n-square communication problem. Instead, we can make it a star network problem so that the front car is not controlling the back car, but it's actually the whole network is controlling the situation, knows when platoons to merge, when cars want to move off, and things like that. And if we get to this kind of situation, again, we need a latency between this whole thing so that the electronic ability control does not build a resonance built up in the millisecond range. Um, if we look at this, this is an old problem from physics. We have different oscillators, the different cars, they accelerate, slow down, accelerate, slow down. This is what you do if you're in a car. Here we took Lego Mindstorm. Ninth grade students built this little demo to, to show the problem. And these cars are following the track and they're all keeping a constant distance. Everything is perfect fine. We do not see that the front car is actually going at a sort of constant speed and the car behind it is going a little faster, slower, faster, slower. We have an oscillation. And if we have oscillations, we have a resonance problem and a stability problem. So we need this centralized control to handle this situation because otherwise, like in this case, when we have this uh, situation where the front car stops, the second car then stops as well, the third car stops as well, but we have, as we can see here, a stability problem. This happens if you have Teslas or Google cars left alone on the road, and this is not so much fun. <laughs> the problem is known from physics, from old time, from theoretical physics, but what is not looked at so far is that this is a phase lock loop coupling problem with stochastic inputs. So if you look at this, you can actually put these nice partial differential equations, they become stochastic partial differential equations. And very quickly you can show that this whole system at a couple wavelengths distance of these two cars behind each other becomes an instable system that cannot be controlled. Yes, and, uh, and then you get these chaotic kind of systems where the cars are swinging back and forth. This is basically just looking at it from a mathematical model. 
we want to take this obvious to the next stage so that we can have intersection with our traffic lights, the people can move. If your cell phone is turned on, you just run into the street, no car hits you. And obviously, if we then implant the newest technology into the frogs of the future, they can cross the road <laughs> and are safe. Now, obviously, I'm in Brazil. Uh, so uh, in Brazil, we like to laugh about the southern neighbors, yes? So we implemented this whole thing, the tactile internet at a in street in uh, intersection here. Oh, sorry, the, this video is not really playing. At a, at a street intersection in Argentina, and you can uh, see this. Uh, I will have to check on this, sorry. But you see that the people are moving very nicely. I should have checked this, sorry, next time. Here you see what is happening here. Uh, we can see, you can put in the hand, the car stop, the cars function. Here this is all with an edge cloud with a controller sitting outside. Uh, you have handoff between these two circles. We demonstrated this in February at the Mobile World Congress and made this whole thing happen. Now you want to take this obviously not only into automotive sphere but also outside other areas like farming. If you want to do precision farming and increase the productivity of crops not only in South America, but also in Africa, in uh, North America, in Europe, in Asia, in many countries, you have to be able to track devices very carefully. You want autonomous driving vehicles that very closely interact with each other. Again, we have this kind of an issue that we have to build this at the millisecond control system uh, with this kind of controls to make sure that the decommissioning truck that comes right next to uh, the harvester is actually controlled very carefully and the harvester that runs into this field and then operates on the field has to also have drones flying up front to do an analysis of the field so that this whole thing can be fully automatically run. You know there's no animal scared hiding in the field that will be killed if you start continuing to drive. Everything has to be completely autonomous and this will revolutionize farming of the future. So if we look at this, what did I talk about? I talked about the tactile internet, and I want to compare this with the cordless phone. 20, 30 years ago, we had cordless phones, and we thought they are great. And there's no need for seller. The seller is for the rich people. And then we found out, no, that problem of cordless phones is we cannot carry them everywhere around. And even if we could carry them everywhere around, the problem is to reach the person on the other side. There were telepoint services tried out with cordless phones so that you have a cordless uh, phone connected to every pay phone. And then what happened is people tried this out in Walnut Creek in Dortmund and they found out I can walk with my cordless phone to the nearest pay phone and connect to the pay phone, make my call, but how do I tell the counterpart to also walk to the pay phone to get connectivity? So the problem really here is this ubiquitous access is not there with cordless telephony, but it is there with cellular. And this we have now driven to the world of the Internet of Things and whatever all is happening now, the great stuff. What I talked about is exactly the same thing in a different era. A cordless phone connects one phone to one base station. What do we do today? We have remote control objects. We have this in construction industry, we have this in toys. The future is to build a ubiquitous infrastructure for controls. And that is the tactile internet. And this has implications all over the place. Yes, in health, in traffic management, in sports, in, in therapy, in agitainment, in manufacturing, in smart grid, whatever all. We can control robots and all these kind of things in factories of the future. With this, I want to talk a little bit about challenges. So I mentioned already, to look at controls, one of the big problems is the mathematics of partial differential equations, stochastic partial differential equations, and whatever all. But this is just one problem. We actually have to build a wireless infrastructure that can do this. Then, if we do that, we have to understand how to put this into silicon, into hardware. Then we need somewhere the control server to be around, 
Since light travels so slowly, we cannot have the control server in Alaska controlling the objects here in Rio. And finally, we have to look at the different applications. They need very different kind of uh, parameters. To do that, we therefore built this 5G Lab Germany. I gathered 20 of my colleagues around uh, in Dresden to look at this, and we also have some experience in starting companies so that we are not only people that can solve equations, which is very important in this case, but also know when and what to be able to take into uh, the industry. And we have an open call asking companies to sponsor us. So far, 10 companies have joined already, and we will have our 5G summit talking about this in September pretty soon. So now let's look at one of the problems. We, talk, we heard about the cloud, but here the problem is the edge cloud. The edge cloud meaning that going from a sensor to the hosted computer to the actuator in a millisecond. Through the embedded computing operating system, transmitter, everything. Which means we have to revolutionize the hosting systems are done. We also have to be able to put the base station and the cloud into one box. This is called the edge cloud. It's at the edge of the network. And we even think we have to put it in one piece of silicon where we can buy, come up with complete new uh, processing architectures where we have processors that swip swap back and forth between control and communication as needed. And for this, the mathematics that is needed is scheduling, guaranteed scheduling mathematics. So new linear algebra methodologies of the future. The next topic is resilience. If I'm in a gaming environment, if something goes wrong, nothing is so bad. If I'm in a traffic environment and the intersection does not function, it is bad. So we need a high resilience system. And we know because wireless communication is not reliable, we have, if we're good, a 3% outage, which means 40 minutes a day the intra infrastructure is not available. So the intersection, the cars crash into each other. That's so good. So, but the good news is this is based on multipath at a certain carrier frequency. And these, so using separate frequencies and separate base stations, we easily can get down to these very low rates. Now, this is a very simplistic way of looking at it. We have to look at the stochastic processes behind this. We have to look at the uh, uh, wave fronts, how they actually function, and all this. So it is a highly complex mathematical problem. And then if you look at this and implement this, like in a test bed here, you can show here, this is downtown Dresden. You see the red th three lines. The bottom line is talking to one base station, the second line to two base stations, the third line to three. We can actually get this guaranteed inter uh, um, communication up to higher levels. So the problem is, doing the math, and then taking it into the field. And third, I just want to touch this in one slide is quickly. Obviously, we need a lot of bandwidth, so we need an air interface that can scale in bandwidth. It has to be what is called multi-carrier. Uh, we need to be able to address these frequencies that are available are at different places all over the spectrum. So we need deep notches, and we have to do this differently from country to country. So to be able to generate this, we can do this with hard analog hardware or with advanced signal processing. And finally, we have to have these short packets. And for this, we have to really go into multi-dimensional synchro processing to come up with the right waveforms that can do this and build these kind of systems. In conclusion, what I was trying to convey is, you know the good old world. The good old world was moving content voice, video, data, whatever. The new world of the tactile internet is moving real and virtual objects. That's a huge step up that we will see happening starting in five years from now. And this will revolutionize the planet. And for that, we need a whole bunch of mathematical advances in stochastic uh, partial differential equations, in uh, theory of stochastic processes and generalized linear algebra in multi-dimensional single processing. It's a whole rich field where we can apply this and it's fun. Just get into it. Thank you.